Well, thank you so much for you all joining us today. Um, I know schedules are all thrown off nowadays, but we're really excited to have you. Um, unfortunately, we haven't seen anyone face to face in so long, but it's nice to connect a little bit over um, Zoom as, uh, you know, not quite the same, but uh, all good. But I'm very excited to have this conversation today as, I mean, most of you all know us very well. My name is Michael Healy, the General Manager of Kiri Travel North America. Um, and I'll soon introduce my colleague, Nia Klatt. Um, today, we really wanted to discuss sustainability. And of course, this is something that has always been a key pillar for Kiri Travel, but we think going forward, it's gonna be more important than ever. We see the impact that travel is having both on a global um, economy and also ecosystems and everything in between. Um, we also know that right now, people are kind of taking the opportunity to reset a little bit and make plans for when travel returns in a post-COVID world, um, what that might look like. <clears throat> um, and just more so than that, I thought it'd be very important to introduce Nia, because again, you know, many of you have met myself or some of the GMs when we come and do sales calls or trainings. Um, a lot of you might have met him over in Asia, but Nia is kind of, of course, the person pulling the strings behind the uh, scenes a little bit. So I thought it'd be really great to get to know her a bit personally and to uh, hear all about our plans for the coming year, what we're currently working on, and to get you guys inspired about what's to come. So with that, uh, I would like to introduce you to my colleague, Nia Klatt, who is tuning in from her home country of Germany. She normally lives in Saigon, but since the borders have been closed, she has been uh, back in her hometown for the longest time in many, many years. So welcome, Nia. And if, uh, yeah, if you don't mind, if you could just give us a bit of background, that would be fantastic. Thank you very much, Mike, and welcome, everyone. I'm really happy um, to see so many of you. Um, and yeah, as Mike said, sustainability is, is uh, super important and it's something we really want to focus on in the next um, or in the coming years. Um, as Mike said, I live usually in, in Saigon, so I'm based in Vietnam um, and I've been in Southeast Asia for the last six years working as sustainability managers in first Thailand, then Laos and Vietnam. And um, I've joined Kiri actually one year ago, exactly one year ago. Um, and I took over the role of regional sustainability coordinator. So what I do, I support all the different destinations on becoming more responsible. Um, so one of the core values at Kiri is really um, the triple bottom line of people, planet and profit. And we're doing our best to reduce our negative impacts on the destinations. Um, and in whatever we do, is it within the office or outside the office? And I support all the destinations um, on that journey. Yeah, so I know you've got, you know, and you're working with all the different destinations and that is basically everything from A to Z, from hiring to, um, I know travel life is something that is huge in each of our destinations. Um, travel life is something I, I know it's something Kiri really, really prides ourselves on because there's a lot of work that goes into it and a lot of good that comes from it. But as I travel around the United States, I realize maybe not a lot of people know about travel life um, as much as they do in, say, Europe, where all the operators are very in tune to what travel life is. And even I think a lot of the consumers are as well. Um, so for those who might not know, would you be able to give us a bit of background about what travel life certification is, what it means to Kiri, what we had to do, all that fun stuff? Right, yeah. So Travel Life is a sustainability certification for two operators. Um, it's based or it originates in, in the Netherlands. Um, and we started this whole journey, I think, in 2015, or that was actually when we got first certified. And I'm super happy and I'm super proud to actually say that Kiri is the first DMC certified in all destinations. Um, and within this travel life certification, you've got different kind of levels, you've got partner levels and you've got the certification level. So um, we, we managed to get the certification actually. So it's the highest level you can, you can reach. Um, travel life is basically, it's a list of criteria, 250 something criteria, all focused on sustainability. So it 
um, involves the internal management, so internal environmental management, but also social um, management and the HR policies. It includes um, how we interact with our staff, what kind of trainings we give, um, what kind of working conditions we have, um, but it also goes into the office or what kind of light bulbs we're using or what kind of paper we're using, what do we do with our waste, um, and then it moves on to our supply chain. So it really includes the tour guides. It in, includes the transport companies we work with. It includes the hotels and the excursion suppliers. And then last but not least, of course, also the, also the clients, how we communicate with the clients and how, um, what we do to protect our destinations. So it's, it's, um, a very detailed process. There's lots and lots of criteria. Um, and basically for the audit, um, every two years, an outside person, an auditor comes into the office, spends one or two days with us, um, really talks to everyone in the office. Um, they can look into our drawers, they can have access to our database. Um, so we really need to, to show them what we do um, in terms of sustainability. And it's usually it's really helpful. It's really great to have somebody coming in and to get that outside view and get new ideas and new inspirations from from usually somebody who's really experienced in sustainability. So that's great. Um, but since they can really speak to anyone and they really check that we do what we say we're doing, um, it's also really, really important to involve everyone. So all our staff from Herman, our CEO, to the office maid in our office. Everyone is really engaged. Everyone joins the trainings. Everyone is involved. Everyone plays a part. And it's um, for us or for me, it's really important that people um, actually understand what sustainability is, why we're doing this, um, what are the reasons behind it and what are the benefits and um, yeah, to get their buy-in basically. I think that's really important. Yeah, and I think that one of the most important things about it is, um, like you said, that it involves everyone because, of course, it goes into not simply the salespeople being able to write back and kind of be able to talk about it a little bit here and there, but it comes down to the operations and how we pick our suppliers and how we hire our guides and what we discuss with our guides before clients arrive. And I think that that's incredibly important because it provides a group buy-in um, and that's another huge reason I wanted to invite all of our partners on this today is because I think, and it's a good thing, no doubt, that sustainability has been such a word that's been used and used and used and almost beaten over your head. But in a lot of ways, unfortunately, I feel like it's gotten desensitized a little bit. Um, and so what I thought was important was that for people to really understand that we're walking the walk in Asia because of course, we're their partners, we're their representatives. So what we're doing in Asia means what they're doing in Asia. So you mentioned something like the supply chain. How does that really come into things, whether it be the hotels we choose or the guys we choose to work with? How, like, how are some of those things so that perhaps our partners can understand better in case they're asked about it later? Right. So for example, with um, the criteria for our guides, the travel life criteria we have to fulfill, um, uh, what are our working conditions for guides? Do we pay them fair wages? But also, how do we choose our guides? Um, do we comply with all the national standards and laws and regulations and all of that? And also, what kind of training do we give our guides? So, and this is something where we really focus on because I think guides, for example, are extremely important. They are on the ground. They see what's going on. They see what's happening. They understand um, our clients, but they also understand um, what's happening within the destination. So I think they are also... Um, yeah, our representatives, they represent Kiri as well. Um, so I think it's extremely important um, to do proper training, to educate the guides like, okay, how am I a responsible tour guide? How do I make sure to respect the local communities? How do I make sure I um, don't have any negative impacts on the environment? If we go into a national park, for example, how do I behave? Or if we go into a village, what is respectful behavior um, and I think that's really important and we've been quite busy with that so we train all our tour guides um, and 
we take them out on inspection tours so that they really understand the products, that they know the products. Um, but yeah, we always have a focus on, on sustainability in these kind of trainings as well. So this is, um, yeah, for, for the, for the guides. Um, you also just mentioned um, the hotels and Travel Life basically asks us, how do you choose your hotels and how do you make sure that they are as responsible as possible? So we have developed a very detailed questionnaire actually, which focuses on different social and cultural and environmental aspects. So we would actually ask our hotels, um, what are your working conditions? What are your HR policies? What kind of trainings do you give to your staff? Um, we um, ask them what kind of waste um, management system do you have in place? How do you promote the local culture? How do you promote local traditions and all of that? Um, and we have this questionnaire, we send it out. Our teams also go on inspections. They have a few questions, sustainability questions they can ask the hotel. And this is how we just trying to um, raise awareness among our supply chain. And this is um, how we, educate our staff so they got to be able to to explain to clients like hey guys we choose this hotel because it's a responsible option um so yeah and i think well mike you you're the expert in in asia um you've seen a lot of the hotels maybe you can give a few examples of the responsible ones of the ones we we like and we do promote especially because they are sustainable suppliers yeah, absolutely. Fortunate I've been able to um, to sleep in a number of these beautiful places and beyond that actually have the, um, you know, the luck to be able to sit down with the general managers and really get a feel for these. You know, there's a lot of beautiful ones and just kind of going off the theme of kind of remote, like we know what we're going to be hearing. We know a lot of folks are going to want to be remote uh, when they come back to travel. So for example, Topasico Lodge up in northern Vietnam is absolutely stunning. Um, but what's really important to me is that they totally understand the um, cultural diversity and sensitivity up there of the um, minority groups. And of course, so what is so important about that to me is that they heavily involve them. They're giving directly back to them. Um, and, you know, I think that in a lot of places, you know, people are just kind of going in villages and, you know, it's almost a human zoo and they, and they do not do that at all. They're really, it's active engagement. So for me, that's a really um, beautiful, responsible hotel, um, and that's promoting culture and the um, and the value of people. Um, beyond that, you know, there's some beautiful nature hotels too, and I think a lot of people will think, for example, of Asia, and they don't necessarily think of wildlife and nature and conservation, which is of course something that you and I are trying to change, and we're doing all that we can for that. Um, it's not Africa, we know that. Uh, it's not even Patagonia, we know that. But it does, um, it does have its own unique challenges, but also really inspiring places. For example, the Cardamom Mountains uh, in Western Cambodia are really outstanding. Um, you know, that's a place that is, I think it's the largest um, migratory path of Asian elephants in Southeast Asia between the Cardamoms and Thailand and in, um, or from Thailand over to Cambodia. And this is a place that was very much unprotected for so long. Um, and unfortunately, with that, there is, there's been huge issues with um, illegal logging is one of the big things you'll hear about. Um, of course, then there's also poaching and, why, and illegal wildlife trade. So I really love the cardamom tent camps that are located there because they've really, you can go in there and you can really legitimately see the difference they've made in the couple of years they've been there. You know, the first month they took away something crazy. I don't know. 40, they confiscated 40 chainsaws. Now they only find one or two chainsaws um, maybe once every six months or something. So it goes to show that responsible positive tourism in these places can really truly be a benefit. Uh, and then of course we can get into this a bit later and then becomes the big issue what we've just come in with now is you know without tourism these rangers can no longer get paid and people are going back to the poaching but we can discuss that when uh, for you know the over tourism versus under tourism <laughs> discussion. When um, you when you stayed at the Cardamom tinted camps, what uh, what animals did you actually see? Was it really close to the accommodation? Was it really 
that you walked out into and you were in the jungle and you could see wildlife? No, you are you are right in the jungle. Um, we had a, we had a blind that we actually went to to see. Um, we got to see some otters, some gibbons, um, a ton of bird life. The bird life is outstanding for anyone who's into that. Um, and then we saw a lot of the tracks of things when we were actually out hiking or. Um, Oh, we saw some crazy snakes, <laughs> in case that's something that you're interested in. I know a lot of people might not be uh, when we were out kayaking. But yeah, yeah, there's a lot going on. People just don't, don't think of it as a wildlife destination, but which means it's all the more important to make it one. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, um, and so, Nia, I also wanted, since we're talking about responsibility in the supply chain and we're talking to our partners. So I know that what they're interested in for sure is of course the guides. Every partner we talk to always talks about guides being most important to making their, their trip for their clients great. Of course the hotels are important, we've discussed that. But the one thing that we also pride ourselves on are the excursions. And so I think that it's important to note um, our new project, which is um, something that you've been working tirelessly on for gosh months now, but it's really starting to see fruition and our clients will start seeing it soon, is um, the Responsible Icon project. So can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Yeah, so um, we looked at all our products and um, all our products, of course, don't harm people or planet. That's for sure. And we have very strict policies in place, especially when it comes to wildlife, when it comes to local communities and when it comes to children. So we don't want to in exploit anyone. We don't want to harm anyone. So, and our teams are trained on that. So once they develop new products, they understand um, what we want to sell, what we want to promote and what we don't want to sell. Um, so we always have these policies in mind. So we make sure all our products actually comply with um, our sustainable values, basically. Um, but looking at the products, I wanted to come up with a system to highlight uh, the, the tours or the itineraries which actively benefit the destinations. Yeah? So um, they're, all, they're all obviously creating some sort of economic benefits to the, to the local um, population, but some of them, they do specifically something which, which benefits the people or the planet. Um, so, and so that's why we created two different icons, um, people and planet, and the different itineraries which are um, beneficial or which are responsible are going to be highlighted from now on with these two icons. So I worked with all the teams and all the different destinations um, to to go through the list of products and then add this little icon to these um, to these tours. So that's that's the idea behind it. And um, actually, very soon we're going to be um, launching these icons. And um, Mike, you've you've done a you've done a webinar already on it, which is going to be um, launched as well very soon. Um, so yeah, tell us what are your favorite responsible excursions? Yeah, so I think, you know, that's what's really great to point out is that these are just simply excursions that go above and beyond in terms of giving back. Um, I know it's a discussion we just had uh, between you and myself is recently the New York Times did an article about regenerative tourism, which I think is, you know, a really cool tour, uh, term. And it's because, you know, sustaining is simply just sustaining. We don't want to do that. We want to even go above and beyond through our excursions and actively giving back to the community. So we do have, you know, a number of these fantastic projects, for example, in Myanmar, where we go and visit the um, Burmese Star Tortoise Center. This is a tortoise that was, I mean, on the verge of extinction. And through this center has been able to, they've been able to breed them there and then re-release them into the wild. Of course, we get to bring your clients there. They get to learn all about it. But even more importantly for that to me is that this center that we helped um, set up also brings in the local community to teach them because you know, it's, it's great to have the travelers get to learn all this, but, you know, for the school children to be able to come in and learn about these native species is really fantastic. Um, there's also another really fantastic one that we have down in Lombok in Indonesia called the Rainbow Village. And this is a place that had um, issues with what to do with waste and trash and pollution. 
and some women, um, you know, it was just getting so bad. And a couple of women got together and they came up with a solution on a more, um, yeah, a more eco-friendly way of getting rid of this. And so we can bring our clients into there to teach them about it. And then we're also being, we're also paying to go into this village. So that money is actively going towards sustaining these projects that these people put together. Um, so again, it's, it's mutually beneficial for both travelers and locals alike, um, which is the point of these icons. And so we want the salespeople of our partners to be able to say, you know, have a list of them. These are the ones that go over the top in terms of giving back. And, you know, when they get a call from a client about their trip and they say, hey, I'm really into conservation or wildlife or protecting uh, cultural identity or whatever it might be, the salespeople from our partners can then go look down this and they already have it all right there. And we also want to be able to explain it, you know, again, how we're actively giving back, not just saying we're doing it, and then also be able to educate our partners so that they can do that as well, which is going to help with sales, it's going to help with inspiration, it's going to help with everything. So that's why I'm super excited about this ICOM project. And um, I, like I said, I've already done a pre-recorded um, version of it that I'll be sending out probably in an upcoming newsletter. And then of course, the salespeople will all have all those responsible excursions for your, um, for your team to be able to look at. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. We're going to um, explain why this product is responsible. And I think that's really something which tourists or travelers are going to look for. They want to do something good, obviously, and they want to support their destination. So I think that's um, something exciting coming up for sure. Yeah, for, I, I, no doubt. And it'll be in, you know, with everything that's happening in this world, I think we're fortunate, we're very boutique and so are in our partners so that, you know, they work with a very progressive, very smart, educated travelers. So they do want to ask these questions and we want to be able to provide you the answers. But, um, you know, beyond these daily excursions, is there another way to maybe do tourism in a more yeah, responsible way um, aside from, you know, just taking a bunch of these and creating an itinerary? Right, so actually we've also used these last few months to um, work on a carbon offsetting program, which again, we are waiting a little bit to launch it, but it's, it's ready, it's, we're gonna communicate very soon on that. Um, and that ties in with an idea um, we had and it's called slow travel. So I think this, this uh, term has been around for, for a while now. People have been talking about it and it, I came across it in different kind of media already. Um, and basically the idea behind is that we understand once we fly to a destination, once we travel within a destination, we create carbon emissions and we have a negative impact on the environment. Yeah. Um, but of course, tourism on the other hand has incredible benefits to local, uh, des to, the, to the destination and especially in developing countries like in Southeast Asia, tourism is extremely important. Um, so we want to find a way to balance uh, the benefits and um, the negative impacts we can have. And then this idea of slow traveling comes in. Um, so we understand, okay, there is, unfortunately, it is long haul flight coming from the US to Southeast Asia. So there's nothing we can do about it. There's no train, it's, it's just not possible, right? Um, but then looking at the, at, the, at the itinerary, what can we do to, once we're there, reduce our carbon emissions? And this is first thing, it's very easy. We could reduce our regional flights. So the, this new um, travel programs um, are without any regional flights, so there's no regional flights. And we have as many responsible excursions in there so that we can show, okay, this is how you really uh, contribute to the development in this destination. And it goes a step further, it's like we take time, so we want to um, if possible, have itineraries of 21 days, 15 days, something very long so that we can make time count. Um, and um, yeah, visit destinations which are not overcrowded, less developed destinations so that the economic benefits are more distributed within the destination as well. Um, 
so yeah this is this is the idea behind our slow travel itineraries which are also coming up very soon right and i think it'll be very helpful for our partners because we can show them as samples and i think um you know naturally from the united states people don't necessarily have not all the time have necessarily as long as europeans do have to travel you know they're not doing or as much these 24 day trips or anything like that. But what I think is very important is to use these um, kind of connectors to be able to cut out a couple regional flights or, you know, just something. And um, whether that's going from Sukhothai to Yangon overland through Pa'an and using a train to get up to Sukhothai from Bangkok, um, we can do that. Or I've done the overland trip from Kantum in central Vietnam to southern Laos to the Bolivar Plateau in southern Laos and I've always really loved this idea of slow travel but most importantly skipping flights when I possibly can because not only is it a better for the environment as you, you know it's very obvious uh, the experience is just there it's outstanding you know you're going to these places that are you know often just flown over so you get a really unique I hate this word, but more authentic experience oftentimes than not. Um, so I think that that not only is it better for the environment, it's actually great for the actual clients themselves. Plus, you're also giving money back to these communities who don't traditionally see it. So there's great ways that, yes, we know that maybe not every American is going to go on this wild, off the beaten path of journey, and that's totally fine. But what, what we've come up with is these connectors that we can take in between the more major destinations to reduce the amount of regional flights, um, which I think is, you know, we would love to do a whole trip with no flights, but at least if we give you these long samples, you can plug in this part and that part to your more traditional itineraries. Yeah, and if if there's not enough time for this very, I understand it's difficult to take off uh, three weeks of work, um, but I mean, yeah, just to have that idea is like, okay, maybe instead of a plane, I can take a train and have a beautiful scenery along the way and um, maybe stop along the way in a town where not many other tourists go. I think that's, that can be really appealing and you can still um, have a positive impact on the destination. Yeah, and especially, you know, everything you read and everything you hear going forward, at least while travel restarts, people are going to be one avoiding crowds. So being up to, you know, all of the most of our clients are going to be doing these, you know, private transfers. But if we can get you into these, you know, less visited places, you're not going to feel swamped or perhaps nervous about, you know, COVID or anything like that. So that's another benefit as well. And I do think will be something that we're going to see as we start to see more and more inquiries come in for 2021 and to even 2022 now, um, people are gonna be much more open to that. You just, we need to know how to explain it, set the right expectations, have great excursions and experiences. And yeah, that's something that Nia and the whole team has been working on. So again, we will definitely be showing you those things um, for sure. So let's uh, just in the essence or keeping time in mind here, um, I did want to talk about I know that you're the director of sustainability, but you also run Kiri Reach, which is our philanthropic um, arm. And so for those that might not be too familiar with Kiri Reach, can you tell us about your responsibilities there and you know what kind of projects we're doing, all that fun stuff? Right. So from the beginning on, when Kiri was founded, there was this idea of we want to give back. We want to do something good and we want to give back to the destinations. So that's when Kiri Reach was founded. It's um, our foundation. And basically what we do, we support uh, sustainable development projects in all our destinations. So it is anything to do with community development, it could be healthcare, it could be education, it could be child protection, it could be cultural promotion, it could be, yeah, anything related to any social issues, but it could also be conservation, um, environmental protection, wildlife conservation, all of that. And in each of the destinations, um, the way we set it up is actually we work with our team. So we have a Kiri um, Reach ambassador, could be from our sales team or operations. In each of the destinations, we have a few and they work directly with the project. So they go out, they meet the projects. Um, there's directly this understanding because they are both locals, they speak the same language. And then our Kiri Reach ambassador is getting involved um, by 
writing reports, visiting the project, um, providing support whenever needed. If it's somewhat related to tourism, we could provide training, for example. Um, and yes, yeah, so this is the this is a project. Um, all donations we get for Key Reach are going 100% to the projects. So all overhead costs are covered by Kiri Travel. So to make sure that if we do get donations from from clients or yeah from from partners, um, everything 100% goes to the projects directly. And um, going back to a project, for example, uh, related to tourism is um, Sambal Prai Cook in Cambodia, which is located halfway between Siem Reap and Phnom Penh. And it started, I think, quite, quite some time ago in 2006, where um, Kiri Reach realized, okay, there's, there's a community and they have beautiful ruins, beautiful temples, and there's a lot of um, opportunity to create a tourism product out of it. The locals are all farmers. Um, and so for them, it's, it's, it's a great opportunity to um, get additional income through um, tourists staying there in the homestays. So uh, Kiri um, Reach, together with GIZ, that's the German Development Agency, they set up this project and um, there was a lot of funding going on in the beginning. And then what Kiri did in Cambodia is they, they came in as the experts training the locals. So they trained the local tour guides on how to be a guide. They trained the homestays in terms of service and, and quality and all of that. And um, together with a local community group, they developed a tour, like a cycling tour. You can take the bicycle, um, drive around the ruins, um, the temples. Uh, you can go across the market cycle um, past beautiful rice paddies it's incredible it's really an amazing experience um, and it's so it changed from supporting and, and providing financial support but also technical support and what we're doing now is we're sending our clients there so this is how we now support the project by sending clients there so that they can make um, profit from tourism additional profit from from tourism so this is one example I'm, I'm uh, really proud of. And um, Mike, you mentioned before, you mentioned the Rainbow Village in, in Indonesia, for example, but I know there's also a few in Myanmar. Maybe you can share your experience because I know you've visited uh, quite a few of them already. Yeah, yeah, definitely have been, again, very fortunate to visit a lot of these really inspiring projects. Um, so one of my favorite ones, and I think it's is, um, the one outside of Bagan, um, where we're building water wells for the local population. So Bagan, I mean, at least all our clients believe so. Everyone thinks that Southeast Asia goes through this tropical rainstorm type of season. Um, but in Bagan, that's absolutely not true. It's actually very, very arid. And they villages have serious issues with accessing the water. Um, because you have to dig so deep into the ground. So what we do is um, we actually bring tourism in there and we can either do one of a few things. We've had partners who come in and they build a full water well. Uh, we also have individual clients who have come in and done a water well and then we do a whole opening celebration for them and you know we bring in uh, the whole village. It's a big party, really fun. Or we can also just do basically X amount, you know, per person, we put X amount aside, and then when we get to it, then we can build a water well in your company's name. Um, and so we've been doing this for many years. I forget how many we've built, but it's actually, I want to say it's something like. Uh, we want to reach 50, I think, by next year. Yeah, I know. I thought we, I thought, you know, in the 40s or the high 30s is the last I heard. Yes. So we really brought a, you know, clean water to a number of those places that are great. And so that's something that Kiri, just like the one in Cambodia, set up. There's also ones that we simply just sponsor as well that you can go and visit. Um, you know, I've been to the, Kuk, the, the primate rescue center in Kuk Phong National Park up in northern Vietnam, which is also a fantastic experience. Um, we sponsor two gibbons from there. Uh, this is a park where they're taking in uh, animals from the illegal wildlife trade and all sorts of other places. Um, hope, hopefully they can rehabilitate them and let them go. The really neat thing is I've actually been fortunate to, also, to see um, 
the primate rescue center and then go out to go to the area where they actually re-release the wild animals. So I got to see it in action and then the, um, the, you know, the success of what this was. So I think, again, this is just such a worthwhile project. And I think when our clients can actually come and see these things firsthand, they're so inspired by it. Um, so, you know, we're able to use Kira Reach in a number of ways. And uh, yeah, fortunately, we have Nia there to kind of arrange it all and, you know, assist with it both from a donation standpoint to a partnership standpoint to even bring our clients there to visit these things. Right. And if... Um if you have any ideas for a specific project you want to to focus on and so if you really let's say into education um or if you're really into healthcare or something we are very happy to support you with setting up your own project or mm -hmm. connecting you with the ngos in the locations to um make projects your own as well so we can do that and um yeah we 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 use our own staff so we work with the locals they know the destinations really well of course and um they know they understand what's needed and they understand um how to work with the local ngos as well which is really beautiful to see mm. yeah definitely and you know it's just it's a that's what we want travel to be is a win-win-win situation for everyone the local community the people that we support the, our travelers our colleagues our partners, everyone. And this is where things like Responsible Icon and the Cure Reach projects and all that, they all meld together to be the, the intersection of exactly what we want travel to be. Um, so one of the last subjects I would like to talk about because it's you know kind of a hot subject right now, unfortunately, as we all know this very personally, is um, you know, I've always talked about over tourism. Um, you know, that's why we do these, these slow travel things and, you know, traveler dispersal is incredibly important to me. Um, but I did not think that I was going to see the day where I thought under tourism was going to be such an issue. Um, and of course, nowadays, this is what we're dealing with. You know, she, Nia talks about our guides earlier and it breaks my heart. I mean, I've personally visited these people in their homes. I've met their grandchildren and their children and their grandmas and all that stuff. Um, you know, and it's just heartbreaking to see so many of them that are now, you know, I don't know, working in a gadget shop here or going back to rice cultivation over here and all that. Um, so when this all turned, when this hopefully knock on wood, when this all turns around me, uh, um, how can we kind of reset ourselves a little bit so that we don't go, you know, that we're providing a quality experience going forward, um, but, you know, in a, you know, without taking advantage, because I, I know everyone's going to be able to be making dollars and cents as soon as these countries open up. So what can we do? Yeah, it's, I think it's a very um, interesting topic and it's very important to discuss that. Um, I think we all have these bucket list items. So going to um, Cambodia, of course, you want to see Angkor Wat. And I completely agree and I completely understand. And I think everyone should should see that. Um, but then, and I'm really happy with that because our teams are able to expand on these, on these bucket list products quite well, actually. So um, instead of seeing just the Angkor Wat main temples, for example, there's, um, they're called Bante Sre, which are two hours north, I think, which are incredible temples. No tourists are there. Um, it's, it's just incredible. So you have these, um, these gems, hidden gems somewhere, and our teams are actually doing amazing jobs to, to come up with itineraries which um, go a bit off the beaten path, who, which visit um, less developed destinations. And I think just looking at, the, at our normal city tours, which we have, um, you know, we have Hanoi, like a local Bangkok, like a local Yangon, Colombo, like a local. It's in all our major cities, we have these like a local tours, um, which actually you, you do visit the main sites. You do visit everything you want to see in the city, but we actually actually also include, um, you know, the, the extra, the local touch. So you take a little tiny back alley and you 
sit down in a coffee shop where you only sit with the locals and you have a coffee break um you have lunch at a lunch place where only the locals have lunch um you visit locals along the way um and yeah we we have some some really great itineraries on that and um these we try in all in all our products to include some local aspects and also looking at the um, Kiri personalities, for example, there's incredible people you visit who have nothing to do with tourism, but are experts in their fields or can really share their culture, can really share the traditions. So we have some great products there already and um, our teams, they know how to set it up and um, I think they develop amazing programs. Yeah. Definitely. And I think that that's really going to be the key going forward is going to be the balance of everything, um, both balance in terms of what you're doing in the more major sites, both in balance of how you create the whole entire itinerary. And this is stuff that we're really, truly focusing off with all of our sales staff so that when you as partners reach out and you're looking for ideas and, you know, or even if you take an inspiration from this, this is where we really want to push people. And fortunately, we do know that people are going to we've already heard this is what people want as well. They want more balance going forward. Unfortunately, you know, there's so much happening in this country from wildfires to hurricanes and um, yes, global, you know, climate change isn't necessarily causing those, but it is accelerating those and exasperating those. So we're fortunate that we work with so many fantastic partners like you who also have great clients so we just want to keep you guys as educated as possible on what we're doing, what the new ideas are, how we can help balance things. And then that way we can take this reset in tourism to really come back stronger than ever in our, um, our core values in which we know all of you share. That's why you're partners with us. So with that, um, you know, if anyone has any questions, whether it's through the chat or want to raise your hand through the participants, um, we'd love to hear from you. I do want to be mindful of everyone's time though as well. Uh, and this will be recorded so you can share with your colleagues who couldn't make it today or people who were furloughed and, might, and will be coming back later. But um, yeah, so fire away if you have anything. But if not, we're always just a quick email away as well. Exactly, yes. Thank you very much everyone for joining. So don't hesitate to reach out. Also, if you have ideas, if you have questions specifically um, to for your clients, or if you want to reach out for Kira Reach projects, we're always happy to to receive your emails. And um, yeah, if you have any questions now, um, the Given Back tours you're referring to. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. So the question is, do, are we getting a lot of demand for the giving back tours? And yeah, most definitely, but it's definitely, it's for our clients, it's different giving back. It's not the like the voluntourism where you're going and building fences or anything. What they're most concerned with is knowing that their dollars and cents are going back to the local community <clears throat> as Nia explained. So that's what's far more popular with the type of clients that travel with us more so than the voluntourism. But the issue is you all need to be, we need to educate you all well enough to be able to sell it. This is how it's giving back. I think there's some, some great examples. So um, what we do a lot, for example, in Cambodia is instead of going to a normal restaurant, we would go to a vocational training restaurant. So by just having lunch in one of these really good restaurants, um, you already give back because these vocational training restaurants work with underprivileged youth and um, they give um, young Khmer um, the opportunity to get a proper education, which is very difficult still sometimes in, in Cambodia. So just um, by adding some of these products, you're already giving back, which is great. Um, same with, we have some workshops um, with, disabled people where disabled people do like a Lenten workshop in Vietnam for example or in um, Thailand we have this massage place um, from from blind masseuse um, so you already by just visiting you're already supporting a good cause yeah so we do have another question um, as a DMC whose chief role it is to fulfill a partner's request 
are you often finding yourself saying no and put in a position where you need to educate your partner? Um, yeah, not, I mean, not totally often. Um, we again are very boutique and we've worked with many of our partners for years, but I remember going back. I mean, we would get all those, the tiger requests going to sleep or, you know, get pictures with the tigers and things like that. And, um, so the thing is, we are not scared to say no, to be very honest. It's not that we're, you know, know-it-alls are better than anyone, but usually just take the tiger situation. When I would explain it, my partner would be like, yeah, that totally makes sense. I'll explain it to this person. Um, so we do find ourselves pushing back a bit, but more so in just an educational way, because it's a two-way street. It's a partnership. It's not, this is a host and you do what I tell you. Um, you know, we want to, this is, we create these uh, relationships for the long haul. Um, uh, you got this from me? Life? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's the same uh, criteria for, I guess it's the same criteria for, for um, worldwide. Um, I do think that there's um, a variety in the sense of what kind of, um, what, what the auditors expect from you. So if you are based in the US, obviously there's a different, you have a different infrastructure available to implement sustainability within your company. Um, so just as an example for us, we, in a lot of the countries, there is no waste water management system in place or it's, uh, well, we don't have the choice to, to um, look for responsible um, energy sources or something like that. Whereas in, in uh, the US, I think you have a yeah, different, different access to, to some of the um, criteria, but generally it's the same criteria for, for each country, for all the countries. Yeah, thank you, Nia. Um, all right. Okay, folks. Well, I think that um, that should be about wrapping it up. It's about 50 minutes, exactly what we planned for. So we really nailed that one on the head, Nia. Um, and again, honestly, we truly appreciate you guys um, coming in, listening to us, having these discussions. But this 50 minutes is in it. You know, we want to keep these going. We want to we want to really take the momentum and more importantly, the time that we currently have right now to make sure that when things come back, that we are all at our strongest. And so, you know, like I said, absolute partnership and we look forward to hearing from you all. Thank you very much for joining. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.